Our next speaker is um, Dr. Amy Prieto. As, uh, Phil was just talking about batteries. Batteries are the bane of our existence. When, you're, when your phone is dead, this becomes a little paperweight. So uh, battery power is kind of a key topic. She is Associate Professor in the Department of Chemistry here at CSU. She's the founder of Prieto Battery Incorporated, which is working on an innovative solid state lithium ion battery. You'll likely be hearing more about the Prieto battery this summer. And we thought she'd be an ideal speaker on the subject of the future of mobility. As we all know, when your digital device is out of power, you're out of business. So improvements in battery power, battery life, and rechargeability are important to us, dependent on these devices. Uh, Dr. Prieto's PhD is in organic chemistry from the University of California at Berkeley. She was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. And while she was there, she was named a L'Oreal Women in Science Fellow. She's won numerous other professional awards outlining the program, including being selected for CSU's prestigious Margaret Hazelius Award for her mentoring of undergraduate and graduate students in chemistry. Her topic today is exploring the future of access to information and the requirement for portable power. So, Dr. Prieto. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I, I hope what you get from my talk today is my absolute passion for chemistry. And, and usually when I tell people that I'm a chemist, there's, I get sort of a disgruntled look and there's usually some comment about, oh, I hated chemistry in high school. And so <laughs> what I want to try um, to do is actually explain why I love what I do and, and also try to get you excited about batteries, which is another thing that often when people think about batteries, they only think about batteries when they're annoyed. So you think about your battery when your phone is running out of power at the end of the day, or when you have a big clunky laptop, and it turns out most of that weight is actually due to the battery, not really to the electronics in, in the device. And so what I like to think about is how can I provide technology in the form of new materials, advanced materials, so that the people who design the devices that we use can really daydream about new functionality. And so what I want to do today is teach you a little bit about batteries and how they work. And I'm going to couch this in, in a little bit of perspective in terms of going back in history first. And then I'll tell you where I think the future of portable power is going. So um, what I want to show you is a picture of what some people believe is the original battery. This is the Volta pile. Um, it was made in about 1800 by Alessandro Volta. He was actually having an argument with a friend who was a physicist. And, and they argued a lot publicly, um, which is one way that scientists learn from each other. You, you posit a hypothesis, and then somebody argues with you, no, this isn't actually the way to think about the problem. And then ideally, working together, you think of some way to test your idea. So in this particular case, he and his friend were trying to understand basically the nervous system of organisms. And they were, they were experimenting on uh, frogs. And what they figured out is if you detach the legs from a frog, so it's obviously not alive anymore, you can pass current through the legs and you can still make them bounce. And they were trying to understand why that was. And so his idea was, what if we try to build a model system to test this idea that what's important in the frog legs is actually the bodily fluids, which are basically salt solutions. So he layered pieces of copper and zinc separated by cardboard, soaked in brine, basically just a salt solution. And what they were able to realize was that this actually does pass current, and it is actually an energy storage device. So most people believe that this was the first battery, um, but actually jars have been discovered outside of Baghdad dating to 200 BC where uh, they're composed of an iron rod encased in copper and soaked in vinegar or wine. And that actually would produce a 0.78 volt battery. It's not at all clear what they used it for, but what I just want to highlight it th is that this technology is, is pretty old. Now, what we use it for today is a whole range of, of devices. Um, and so here I just put some of my favorite, uh, my MacBook Air, which, I, which is my entire life, basically. Um, the device on the top right, which I wish I had, Tesla Roadster, and it's an all-electric vehicle. Uh, the difference between the batteries and those two devices is, is simply that the Roadster has almost 7,000 of the batteries that you would find in a laptop. But the basic engineering is the same. We can go to mobile devices, obviously, but then a one that's very important to me. Um, here I'm showing you just an example of a wind farm. I could as easily have replaced that with a solar array. And the idea here is that for renewable energy, the sun doesn't always shine, and the wind doesn't always blow. And so ideally, we would like to have some kind of an energy storage device so that we can really capture everything we can get during these intermittent periods and then use it when we need to later. 
So all of these devices depend on batteries. And what I really want you to get out of today is that there is no one perfect battery for every single device. There's a range of chemistry we can use, and each kind of chemistry has different pros and cons. So you really have to think of the ultimate application that you care about when you're designing your battery so that you can really optimize the physical performance. So the, the kinds of plots that battery people look at uh, look like this. Uh, the, and, and the major metrics here are in the y-axis energy density in units of watt hours per liter, so volumetric density. And then again, in the x-axis energy density as a unit of watt hour per mass, so watt hours per kilogram. So uh, if you drive sort of a conventional vehicle, you have a lead acid battery. It's on the lower left corner of this plot because it's so heavy. So lead um, is a very heavy element, but it's really robust. These batteries work whether it's really cold or it's really hot out for the most part, and they can turn over a lot of times. It's also really, really cheap, and so that's why it's good for a uh, market like vehicles. Now, if you drive something like a, a Prius, you have a nickel metal hydride battery, and then in all of our portable electronics, we use lithium. And the reason we use lithium is because it is the element that is both the lightest and it has the largest voltage window. And so the, the, the power of your battery is determined by the voltage of the chemistry you're using and how much current you can get in and out of it. Now, lithium metal is not particularly safe. You might have seen in a, in a high school chemistry class or if you took uh, chemistry here at CSU, you've, if you put sodium or, or potassium metal into water, it starts a fire. Lithium is very much like that. And you've probably read about lithium ion battery fires in the news, um, whether it's a laptop recall, a Boeing Dreamliner uh, with a battery that catches on fire, any of those kinds of applications. And so the challenge here is that lithium stores a lot of energy, but sometimes that energy comes out in ways that we don't want it to. And so we really have to think about how we build safety into our devices. So there's a range of different kinds of lithium ion metal chemistry. And really the innovation in this field happened in 1991. Sony was the first company to really mass produce lithium ion batteries that were rechargeable. A lot of the metrics for those original batteries have been improved sort of at a steady rate of 4 to 8 percent a year, which is the exact opposite of exponential as we were hearing from our first speaker. And so that's the real problem. Battery technology, although it gets a little bit better every year, it's not getting better fast enough to keep up with the, the new modern devices that we all want. Now this plot has been expanded recently. So what I was just showing you was this tiny little corner down here. I'm adding a different device onto here. Now this is not a battery, it's an ultra capacitor. But Basically, everything we were just looking at, we can fit in this tiny little corner. There are some early results of now a, a company, Envia, that's produced a battery pack that stores a lot of energy per unit volume. And now I've also changed the axes. So here, energy density, which we were just talking about. Now the y-axis is power density, which is how fast can you get power in and out of your battery. So another really important metric. Now the ideal uh, battery would not only store a lot of energy, like this example, but you would get it in and out really quickly. And that's a problem. We don't have anything in this top right corner yet. So we, what we really need to do is invent a new kind of a device that will let us store a lot of energy but get it in and out really fast. And then we need to pay attention to these other metrics that are also challenges for batteries. We need not just energy density and power density, but we need something that has a very long cycle life. So we need something that you can charge, say, every day or every other day, and instead of only lasting a year or a year and a half, ideally it will last five to 10 years. We also need something that is affordable. Um, and this is a personal goal of mine. Um, it's to make a battery that's so cheap that everybody can use it. So the Department of Energy has set a cost goal of $250 per kilowatt hour for battery technology. Um, A123, which is a very large US-based lithium-ion battery manufacturing company, were selling their batteries at $1,000 per kilowatt hour. Um, and so, so this is a problem because it's so expensive. So they started selling their batteries for about $750 per kilowatt hour, but it was still costing almost $1,000 to make it. And so not surprisingly, this company went bankrupt. Um, They've since been restructured and, and they're back in business uh, with a real goal of, of trying to think about manufacturing. And so that's an important theme and I'll come back to that. But if we're gonna make something really cheap, we need to have some practical ability to scale it up. And so I would argue that that's where chemists and engineers come in. And that's 
where we really need to think about from the very beginning, what kinds of methods are we going to use to build batteries that we can scale in a way that's not only cheap, not only so we can make a lot of them, but I would also argue where we need to be able to do it in some kind of a socially conscious way, um, where it is environmentally friendly. And then finally, the, the part that I've really been thinking about a lot in the last year or so is that we have some new metrics that people care about that aren't couched in the kind of traditional language that battery chemists and, and engineers normally use. And I will show you what I mean by that when I highlight some of our, our very new devices that we care about. So let's take a, a step back from a minute, a minute from um, batteries and let me tell you about what's driving some of the applications that I've been thinking about. And this really has to do with our, our desire not only for mobile technology, but for a lot of the devices in our daily life to be wired. So I've been reading a lot about the Internet of Things, um, and this is really a, a movement where people are thinking about objects, animals, or people that can basically all be assigned an IP address. And so these um, objects, animals, or people need to be able to transfer data over a network without requiring human-to-human -human or human-to-computer interaction. So basically, we want our devices to be able to store data, transmit data, track data, without humans having to input any of that or to transfer any of it. So this not only requires huge advances in computing, but what I think about when I read about that is that that means every single one of those devices has to have a power supply of some kind. And for many of those, simply plugging it into a wall is not sufficient. We need it to be mobile. So what this means is that we have a lot of really smart people thinking about incredible devices. And what I would argue today is that their ability to be creative and to brainstorm is limited fundamentally by the batteries that we can use. And so that's a problem that I'm hoping to solve. So the way your battery works, um, so if you have, say, a cell phone on you today, which I'm sure almost all of you do, or a laptop, you basically have three important components in your battery. You have a positive electrode that is normally made out of a metal oxide, something like lithium cobalt oxide. You have a negative electrode in all of your devices, it's graphite. And the shuttle between those two are lithium ions. So if I plug this whole device into a, um, some kind of a circuit to do work, I get electrons that are going to go from this side when the battery is charged through the circuit to do work and be deposited on the positive side. To maintain charge balance, I have to have lithium ions diffused from this side to the other side, and this happens in some kind of an electrolyte. That middle piece is really important. This is what allows lithium ions to travel back and forth, but also what prevents your battery from shorting. So it needs to be something that is really robust. It has to be electrically insulating, but ionically conductive, and, and that's sort of two contradictory requirements. Now, people already know that if you make the electrodes very high surface area, so imagine something like the bristles on a brush or, or really, really fine powders, that the individual electrodes charge and discharge very quickly because the lithium ions don't have very far to go. The problem is, even if I make this high surface area and this very high surface area, if I don't get them close to each other, it's, it's just like if you live far from where you work. The commute time will be long. And so you, you end up with a battery that doesn't charge very fast. And so that's the problem that people really do need to solve. And this is, um, I'll show you just sort of one approach to trying to solve that. OK, so all the batteries that we have look like one of these architectures today. Either something that looks kind of like a AA or AAA battery, or in this case on the bottom right, the battery in your cell phone. And in all of these cases, I'm going to call this a two-dimensional battery. They're all films that get stacked or rolled. And the problem is that if I want this battery to store a lot of energy on one charge, so think about your phone and you want it to last all day, the way to do that is to make all these layers really thick. So I need to pack a lot of material in there because the amount of energy your battery stores is directly related to the number of lithium ions that you have. But if I make these layers really thick, the lithium ions have a long way to go. And so the battery's not going to charge or discharge very quickly. However, if I make these really, really thin to make the battery fast, then I can't, I can't store a lot of energy. And so in two-dimensional batteries, that problem cannot be decoupled. You can't optimize both at the same time. So when I was just starting here at CSU and I was thinking about problems that I thought would be really important for a chemist to work on, something where we could really impact a lot of people, and I really focused on batteries because I, every technology I could think of was being limited by the battery, not by the, the fundamental technology of the device. 
And I was thinking about this particular problem, and I thought, why, why stay with these conventional geometries? Why not think of a new way to put a battery together where you could improve the rate of charging and also improve how much energy you store? And so that got me thinking, well, if we're going to invent a new kind of battery anyway, why don't we make a dream list of all of the attributes this battery would have to have before we start thinking about specific chemicals to work on? If we have this whole dream list, it's really like thinking about how would I hit a home run, and then I can work my way backwards and fill in all the steps along the way. So this is the list that my students and I came up with. The dream battery would be a single device that has the attributes of an ultra capacitor, so it'd be really fast to charge and discharge, and it would also have the ability to store a lot of energy the way a lithium ion battery does. It would also have the ability to decouple this energy and power density. So again, energy, how long will your battery last on a single charge, power, how fast can I charge and discharge it, but also some of the applications you use today are very power hungry. So you've probably noticed on your phone if you're using the GPS function or you're streaming videos, the battery drains pretty quickly. And that's because those applications are really uh, power hungry. And so we need to find a way to be able to satisfy both things. Low cost manufacturing at scale. I really wanted to try to dream of a way to build all of this where we could scale up in a reasonable way and ultimately make a really cheap battery. And then also safe. So battery fires are difficult to put out because lithium ion battery fires get really hot. The basic problem is you have a fire, um, the liquid that's normally used in your batteries is flammable. So once you have a fire and it has a flammable liquid nearby, it sort of has a fuel that can keep going. And then once the, the temperature goes up, your cathode decomposes to generate oxygen. So you have a flammable liquid with a fire with an oxygen source, and this is a really bad combination. So, the other key part, though, is that the salt that's used in that liquid, um, when it's exposed to water, it can generate hydrofluoric acid, which etches bone. And so there are some states where if you're, and Colorado's one of them, actually, where if you're in an accident in an all-electric vehicle, EMTs are not supposed to try to get you out. They're supposed to wait for a hazmat team to arrive. And I don't actually know. We have some EMTs in my family. I can't imagine them just standing by and waiting for a hazmat team to arrive. And it's because of some of the caustic chemicals that are present that it could be a danger to first responders. And so I really wanted to think about how we could make this battery safe. We wanted to build a battery that would operate over a large range of temperatures. From high temperatures, um, you could think about your car being pretty warm on a hot summer day, to low temperatures. Um, my family's all from Michigan, and so in the winter, starting a car can be prob problematic if it's battery powered. So we wanted to be able to solve that problem. And uh, what I was really thinking about were cool devices like these, wearable devices, like the watch that's coming out today, a uh, headset that I'm going to show you in a minute. In all of those cases, you want a battery that takes up very small volume. You, you want your battery to not have to take prime real estate from the electronics of your device. So would there be a way to make a battery that eliminates a lot of the excessive packaging that we have to use now to keep batteries safe? And then finally, want to be able to provide custom shapes and sizes. Again, it doesn't really matter if you think about for a, a wind farm or a solar array, if I have huge batteries, um, and, and people do build batteries like that today that are basically the size of um, huge trailer trucks. In that case, the shape doesn't really matter and the weight doesn't matter. But in all your portable devices, it does. And so again, bring, driving home the point, there's no one perfect battery for every application, but many applications have really unique requirements. And this shape and size one is, a, is an important one. So there are a lot of people working on trying to meet all of these metrics. And uh, I'll show you kind of a list of companies that I think at the end are doing really innovative work. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes telling you about the approach that um, my students and I have taken to try to solve these problems and the company that we founded together, um, the approach that we've taken. So this is a normal battery. I, I highlighted an iPhone because I'm addicted. My phone is on me all the time, so this is the battery I think about the most. In a normal battery, you can charge in about two hours. There are some technologies now where they're trying to drive that down. There are some batteries where you can charge most of the way in about 30 minutes, but you can't do a full charge that quickly. And if you use it really heavily, seven hours to a day, depending on what you're doing. Now again, it's because there are all these layers, so you can't charge that quickly, and the layers aren't really, um, they can't be that thick. 
in a, in a device like a nice sleek phone, um, and so they can't store a lot of energy. Again, some toxic byproducts in the chemistry, and what's key is that this is just a 2D battery. So what we're trying to build is what we're gonna call a three-dimensional battery. A high surface area battery, it's actually just a single piece, and I'll show you how we make it. The dream is to be able to charge it fully in five minutes and have it have about 30% longer life than a conventional battery. So even if I'm using GPS and I'm streaming videos, I want my battery to be able to last at least 10 hours on a single charge. I want it to be all water-based, um, and this again comes back to the social consciousness piece of things. Um, hopefully by the end of my career, I'll have invented something really useful. Uh, but if the way to manufacture that produces a lot of toxic byproducts in the manufacturing process, to me that, that's not really um, an overall benefit to humanity. So the battery that we want to build is all made out of water on a bench top using non-toxic chemistry. And it really starts from a piece that looks like this. It's basically a foam, so a three-dimensional structure. So what we did is we... Uh, we learned a lot from people who've tried to do this in the past, and we tried to take a big step back again and not think about specific chemicals, just think about the process. And we decided we wanted to make high surface area electrodes, but they have to be interdigitated. And making one piece and then trying to assemble it with another separate piece is really hard once you have high surface area structures. So we decided we were gonna start from one piece and use it as the tool to build the rest of the battery. So we start with a piece of copper foam, we plate our anode onto it, coat that with our polymer electrolyte, which is solid, so there's no flammable liquid, there's no toxic byproducts, and then we fill in with our cathode at the end. So it's a lot like taking a sponge that you've coated with a couple of different layers, and then you put it into water, and it's gonna soak up the water. And so that's how we make our 3D battery. The cartoon of it and the, the cross-section, um, it can be very irregular, it doesn't really matter. Here we have our copper foam, our anode, our polymer, cathode all around it, and then we just add aluminum current collectors and we build up capacity just by adding multiple layers, but each layer stores a lot of energy and is really fast. So then getting back to the components, um, so that as a chemist, I, what I love doing is making new materials. It's a lot like cooking. I love knowing you know, there's a solution to a problem that people agree on, but nobody knows how to make the materials that are important to kind of realize those solutions. So for each component, we made a list of the physical requirements we need for that piece before we thought about the chemicals, and then we kept asking ourselves, does this component solve any of the problems or any of the dream attributes I showed you on one of the previous slides? So the copper foam that we use, we can buy it by the roll, um, and we just cut out the footprint of the battery that we want to build. So if you want to build a smartphone, cut out a footprint that looks like this. If you want a tablet, um, battery, you cut out a footprint like this. You could imagine making a wedge-shaped battery or making a curved battery. It doesn't matter what the shape is. This high surface area, it's about 98% air. This sets the power density of the battery. So this is what's going to allow us to charge and discharge very quickly. So then we need to apply our anode material. And again, to get to this low cost, the way we decided to approach this was we made a list of all the equipment we were not allowed to use. So I have incredibly patient students. I come up with these crazy lists, and they, uh, they, are, they are completely on board with, okay, how are we gonna do this? It's a fun problem. So on this list, we put all the equipment that battery people normally like to use. So they were not allowed to use anything that required high temperature, not allowed to use anything that required a clean room, or any kind of really expensive equipment. From that, we came down to electroplating, which has never been used in the battery industry, but it's very widely used in many other industries. All the copper connects on your integrated circuits are made by electroplating. A lot of jewelry is coated by electroplating. High-end car bumpers, even Boeing 787s are electroplated. So I know it's scalable. I know that the equipment to do that is really, really cheap. There just aren't very many examples of battery materials being directly electroplated. And so that's where we got to innovate. So we couldn't figure out how to electroplate graphite, which I told you is the common anode. Instead, we picked this compound, copper and timonide, it is, it is purple, it's a gorgeous purple color, and it uh, stores three times more lithium per unit volume than graphite does. So already we can improve the amount of energy that our battery is gonna store, and it's also much safer. The, the chemistry that goes on when you charge this material is much safer than with graphite, and so you eliminate the potential for this lithium plating problem, which is one of the causes of battery fires. So already we're starting to build in the safety at the first piece. Then we use, um, 
electrochemistry to conformally coat this whole structure with a very thin polymer. We don't use the liquid electrolyte that's normally used in a battery, so this is where we've eliminated the flammability of that liquid. And it turns out that a side benefit of this approach is that our batteries have increased life cycle. So even charging and discharging really fast, we were able to hit 1,000 cycles pretty easily. And if you think about that, to put it into perspective, your phone, is re your phone battery is really rated for about 500 cycles at a slower rate. So already we've improved the lifetime of the batteries. And then in the last piece, we use industry available cathode materials. We've just modified the slurry chemistry so it is water-based. So all of these steps happen out of water. Um, as an example, the chemical we use to control this process is citric acid, which is a very common food preservative. One of the components of our polymer electrolyte is actually used as a laxative for infants. So again, my dream of could we make this as low impact on the environment as possible? And the equipment is really, really cheap. So a lot of scientists you know, collect a lot of data. I showed you some, some plots. But the key data that we typically use are, are images. And this, um, if we want to talk about data storage, this is a huge draw on data storage. This is a scanning electron microscope image. This is our copper foam that's been coated with our anode. And if you zoom in, you can see a lot of features on how the material plated. This teaches us a lot about our process and lets us go back and optimize it. If you zoom in further, you can see these tiny little cubic facets. And the reason we have to use this technique, this electron microscopy, is because these features are smaller in some cases than the wavelength of visible light. So you can't see them by optical microscopy, but you can if you use electrons. And, and what's key about this is that this, again, you can see the high surface area, a lot of room for the other materials, and this is how we store a lot of energy. The process is really fast. To make this electrode took about two minutes. And so this is another way that we drive down the cost of the overall process. So to make the full 3D battery, this is just uh, another SEM image of, of our battery fully assembled. What you see here is the copper foam is hollow. This is our anode material conformally coated. This very thin layer stores enough capacity in the footprint of a smartphone to power a, a normal, of, uh, I guess one of today's modern, modern phones, even though it's so thin. And this is because it stores a lot of lithium, again, per unit volume. This is our polymer electrolyte. This is the layer that lets the lithium ions go back and forth, but keeps the battery safe, prevents the shorts. And then this, all this material outside is the cathode. And this is just another view of this. So we've been able to make uh, a three-dimensional battery. It is solid state. What we know today is that our battery can cycle many cycles. It does work over a range of temperatures, but we have a lot of optimization to do at low temperatures. Our battery actually works much better when it's heated. And so this is actually a good thing for some applications because if you're charging and discharging really fast, there's some resistive heating. And it turns out that our battery actually gets better as that happens. But at very low temperatures, our battery still is pretty sluggish. So we're working on optimizing that. Now, so we're just one group of people that have approached this problem in this way. I wanted to give you kind of a, a range of startup companies that I think are going to impact battery technology over the next five to 10 years. And they fall in different camps. There's, there are a group of batteries um, that really are working still on two-dimensional batteries. But what they're trying to do is each optimize one piece of the battery to make that component better. So as an example, A123 just works on cathode materials. And so that's just that one electrode in the battery. And what they're really trying to do is invent new materials that will store a lot more energy per unit volume and per unit mass. Then there are people working on new materials. I highlighted silicon. I told you we use copper and timonite as our, as our anode, so our analogy to graphite. Silicon would store four times more lithium than graphite does per unit volume. The problem is it pulverizes itself as you cycle it. So the life cycle of these batteries is really short. So this is what these startup companies are really working on trying to improve. And then there are a whole range of interesting companies working on solid state batteries. So batteries that eliminate this flammable liquid electrolyte, these kinds of batteries tend to last a long time, but they tend to be too slow. And so that's what they're trying to work on. Again, maintaining the cycle life, but make these batteries really fast. And again, the really big challenge is that, is that there's been really no significant commercially sustainable battery innovation in, in the last decade. 
What I mean by significant is I mean a 5x improvement in some metric. There have been improvements, again, 4 to 8% a year, but nobody's really been able to sort of double, triple, quintuple any metric. And commercially sustainable, a lot of the methods that, that battery people are using to make their materials are not scalable or they're really expensive. And I, I think that um, you could call it being practical or being lazy, but if you're going to work really hard on something, I think it, it, it's good to think about the end goal when you start so that you don't have to get all the way to the end and then try to improve or fix a problem that you knew about from the beginning. So I really think manufacturing is going to be absolutely critical. So just to end, looking for the next five to 15 years, what's important is that the battery industry is already enormous. Um, there's a, a research report that was just published in the fourth quarter of 2014 that said that the advanced battery industry, so not car batteries, not lead acid batteries, really just focused on lithium ion batteries. They're going to ship a total of 62.2 gigawatt hours of batteries in 2014 alone. And actually, it turned out by the end of 2014, that number had been exceeded slightly. And that was an industry worth about 20 billion. It's anticipated, though, that the vast majority of the batteries um, that grow over this next year that are shipped over 2015 are going to go into portable power applications. So things like all of our devices, wearable devices, and uh, power, electron power tools, excuse me. So this demand is clearly going to grow. It's not like people are going to give up their wearable devices. And as the devices get more and more advanced, the battery technology is still going to be the limiting factor. The improvements in the metrics for batteries that I listed before, so energy density, power density, those are all going to have to dramatically improve. But what we're learning is that these improvements are going to have to come from new chemistry and new architectures of batteries. It's not going to be enough to just use engineering to optimize the way batteries are assembled in small ways. It's really going to have to be a jump. And I think what's really key to me is that a lot of the new devices that we're trying to use really require metrics that battery people are not used to talking about. So for example, the watch that was really excited to see today, and also say headsets. This is the Jarvis headset that was profiled by Intel last year at the Consumer Electronics Show. What, what I see when I look at this device is I see something that has an unusual shape. I see something that the, you can't really imagine putting a conventional battery in because there's no flat space that you can really put that device into. When I look at this battery, what I see is that this part of the battery is really thick. And although I haven't taken one apart yet, I can bet you, I would bet any of you money, most of that real estate is the battery. And that's a shame, because that means that the people that were designing the functionality of the device were limited by the batteries that they could procure. So these are the kinds of problems I love. So when I look at this watch, what I daydream about is, what if instead of putting the battery here, we made the battery the flexible part of the band that wraps around your wrist. So this means that you need to make a really thin battery. You need to eliminate a lot of the packaging that you normally use to keep it safe. You need to make this battery flexible so that it's comfortable to wear, and so that you can use all this space that's not being used for anything else and keep the space in the device for the really important functionality that we care about. And so that's, that's really kind of the state of battery industry today. I'll tell you sort of in a, a sobering statistic is over the last 10 years, investors have been very hesitant to invest in really high risk battery research because they were concerned that they wouldn't get a quick return on their investment. What's an advantage though for people working on batteries is that there still are no amazing batteries that they can buy for these kinds of devices. So there will always be this need for innovation, and the need for innovation is not going to go away anytime soon. So with that, thank you again for, for coming, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So the question was, in, our, in the battery design I showed, the 3D battery, is the cathode completely electrically connected? You're asking about the cathode, right? Oh, the anode. They are both completely electrically connected. So that copper foam that I showed is the current collector. So when we deposit our anode onto it, it is already a functioning electrode. And then the cathode side is 
also electrically connected to an aluminum mesh that we use. And so one thing we're thinking about is actually having the outside packaging also be the current collector on the cathode side so that we get rid of some of the space that you would normally use as the, as the packaging material. That's a good question. Yeah, right there. So the question was about the mechanical flexibility of our 3D battery. It's quite mechanically flex. So the copper foam itself is really soft. And the copper intimidite we use on top is also soft. The polymer was designed to be mechanically flexible because it has to breathe in and out. Well, um, actually, when your battery materials charge and discharge, they expand and contract. And so the polymer has to accommodate that. The cathode story on the outside, though, when it's dry, is a little bit brittle. And so we know that we can bend it we probably can't bend it hundreds of times. That would probably um, fracture it. But for this kind of a wearable device, you're actually not bending by much. The, the angle that the battery has to be able to, to accommodate is really pretty modest. And so it should work for this kind of a. There's a really cool new company. Um, I, sh I don't know exactly how they build their battery yet, so I'm trying to figure it out. It's called Prologium, and you can Google this. On YouTube, there are amazing videos. They have made a battery that you can flex and twist and bend. You can puncture it and it still works. And it's also pretty thin. And so they're um, a, just a really cool technology. But their battery, I think, is, um, would be ideal for these kinds of wearable devices where you would want to flex it more. So. Any other questions? So the question is, what kinds of solutions are on the near horizon for, for solar, wind farms, so very large? Um, there are a few ways that people are trying to approach this problem. One way is to use a battery technology. It is actually a battery. The term that's used is redox flow, but they're basically um, huge tanks of liquid. And each side of the tank stores a different chemical. And it's the difference between those two chemicals that stores energy. So in this case, you don't care about the weight at all. You don't care about the size. The challenges are that the chemicals that are used are pretty expensive today. And it's hard to dissolve a lot of the chemicals in normal solvents. And so this is a lot like thinking about, um, in this particular case, if you think about salt or sugar dissolving in water, the more energy you store is directly related to how much you can dissolve. And so the problem is, how do you design chemicals that are really, really soluble? The other thing that people are thinking about, and this is something that I'm, my group's working on, my academic group at CSU, is moving away from lithium and using something like sodium. Sodium's a lot more earth abundant than lithium is. Again, you don't care about the weight. Sodium's a lot heavier than lithium, but it's a lot cheaper. And so people are trying to develop new battery chemistry using sodium. It would function in a way, it's similar way to lithium, but it would be a lot cheaper. The problem is the chemistry is really hard. So that, that kind of chemistry, I think, is 10 to 15 years out. And then even further out would be um, lithium and sodium are limited in that each ion carries just one electron that you can use. And the current of your device is basically current is just number of electrons. So people are working on using elements that store or can donate two electrons or three electrons per element. That chemistry is very hard. Um, and so, so Toyota, for example, has a 50-year timeline of the batteries they want to put into cars. Lithium ion is supposed to take us through the next 10 years or so. Magnesium batteries um, are supposed to be at about year 20 to 25. That's two electrons per element. And then very far out, 35 to 50 years, would be lithium air chemistry, so um, where air is actually one of the electrodes in the battery. So. Um, also, that chemistry is just really hard. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. OK, so the current status of my company. So we're actually based in the Research Innovation Center, which for all the undergrads in this room, thank you so much. You guys voted to use your undergrad student fees to build this building as an incubator space for startup companies. And what I was told when it was first being built from some undergrads was, you know, we love living here, so we don't want to go anywhere. So if we can help startup companies get off the ground, you will create jobs locally. That, and 
amazing idea. So there are only eight of us now, one business person really, um, and then seven scientists and engineers. We have made the anode that I showed you is sample ready and we've sent it to third party uh, larger companies to test. Um, and then the full 3D battery, we are just now embarking on a statement of work from a much larger partner to produce a very specific prototype that will hopefully be done by the end of December. And then if that goes well, the idea is that that will lead to a, a pretty direct path to a, a very specific application. And that application will actually be for a wearable kind of device. So still optimizing, still developing, um, still raising money, unfortunately. So if anybody here has a checkbook that they want to bring up, that would be great. But, um, but the science actually, actually works. The, the battery actually does work. We just have to make it better. The full 3D battery, we want to make it faster. Our calculations predicted it's five times faster. We routinely go kind of two times faster than a normal battery, but we want to improve that. Anyway. So still, still optimizing and tweaking, but finally to the point where we can send samples to other people for testing. Yeah. Congratulations. Great. Thank you.